Great. Well, I'm really happy to get started this evening. Uh, my name's Eliza Canty Jones, and I'm on staff at the Oregon Historical Society. We're really excited to be the co hosts of tonight's program on early Chinese American history of Portland's Louis Chung with Jennifer Fang and Myron, uh, Myron Lee. We want to take a few minutes at the beginning of our program to acknowledge the place where we are. Um, I'm here in Southeast Portland. Wherever you are in Oregon or in the United States, you're on indigenous land. What you have on the screen here is a map that's in our Experience Oregon exhibit, and it shows some of the many languages that have been spoken in this region for thousands of years. These are indigenous languages of this place where we live now. Um, and we also recognize some of the specific peoples whose homelands are here in Portland, where the Oregon Historical Society is based. And we know a lot of folks have been become accustomed to land acknowledgements, and there's a lot of discussions about uh, the right way to do them or the appropriateness. But one of the things that we think about at the Oregon Historical Society with land acknowledgements is that we do want to be grounded in the place where we are. And when we want to recognize that whenever we're talking about Oregon history, we're talking about history that really is thousands of years old. It begins with indigenous people. We want to acknowledge that there are nine federally recognized sovereign native nations here in the state of Oregon today that have government to government relationships with the state of Oregon and with the United States. And we want to think about the histories, of, particularly of the past two centuries, the, the violence and genocide, the treaty relationships, the survivance and the, the ongoing uh, practice of cultural and spiritual and uh, physical practices that Native peoples continue in Oregon across the state. So we really encourage folks to get to know the tribal nations that are nearby to your community in Oregon or wherever you are and to respect their sovereignty and to pay attention to the kinds of advocacy that, that tribes make in Oregon and elsewhere. So always wanna take some time to be mindful of that history uh, and the ongoing presence of these sovereign nations in Oregon. Uh, we're really pleased tonight to have a partner in our program, the Portland Chinatown Museum, uh, which Oregon Historical Society has a long partnership with. And joining us this evening is Anna Truxis, who is the executive director of Portland Chinatown Museum, is gonna say a little bit uh, about the museum for all of us. Hi, Anna. Hi, Eliza. Thank you so much for having the Portland Chinatown Museum here with this incredible presentation tonight. I um, just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay, because there's a weird echo on my end. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, so just a brief bit of history for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Portland Chinatown Museum. We opened in December of 2018. Uh, it was the work of a dedicated group of uh, elders with connections to Chinatown. And uh, one of the presenters tonight was one of the founding members of the staff, Jennifer Fang. It includes a really beautiful exhibition that had its start at the Oregon Historical Society, the Beyond the Gate that tells the story of Portland's two Chinatowns. And we also have a contemporary art space where we are exploring the present and future of Portland's Chinatown. We're thrilled to be here tonight we had we been here in person at OHS, mm -hmm. we would have had a table in the lobby and we would have offered different things. And so in lieu of that, we would like to offer to anybody who would like to visit the museum who's here tonight with us, you may email us at info at portlandchinatownmuseum.org and we'll arrange for a 20% off ticket. Um, and I'll probably be the one fielding those emails uh, since it was kind of you know, a decision we made when we found out we were switching to remote. Um, thanks again for having us here. We're really looking forward to the presentation and appreciate so much the special issue of OHQ. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. We loved having Beyond the Gate at the Oregon Historical Society and are thrilled it has a permanent home in Portland Chinatown Museum. If you haven't been, go. If you haven't been, make a plan to go again. You'll learn something new. And just so folks know, they're in the... Um, there in the chat is the, the email address that Anna said and a subject line that you can put in so you can get those 20% off tickets and take advantage. Thanks very much, Anna. So tonight's program is brought to you from a special issue of the Oregon Historical Quarterly that we created uh, collaboratively with Jennifer Fang and Chelsea Rose as co-guest editors. 
and in partnership with the Oregon Chinese Diaspora Project, uh, which is an incredible organization that has worked in partnership with many, many uh, public and private agencies to advance our understanding of Chinese history in Oregon. We're really thrilled to work with all of those community knowledge holders and archaeologists uh, who have done so much work to reframe how we understand Oregon history, uh, and in particular, Chinese history in Oregon. And so because this history is all over the state of Oregon, uh, we decided to take OHQ on the road and schedule a bunch of programs where we could talk in local places about the history that's in the special issue. So we were in Eugene last week. Uh, tonight, we would have been uh, in downtown Portland, uh, but for COVID. So we switched to virtual. And I see from the chat, that means we have an audience member from Beijing. So we can be glad about that. And thanks for joining us. Uh, but we want to let folks know about where else we will be. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be in Ashland, Oregon. Uh, and then the week after that, we will be over in John Day and Canyon City. There's a waiting list now for tours of the archaeology sites, but please uh, sign up for that if you want to. But there will be plenty of room uh, at the community hall in Canyon City uh, on the evening of Friday, June 24th. So come out and hear about Chinese mining in Eastern Oregon. There'll be an open house at the Wing Hong Hai Company Store in the Dows on Sunday, June 26. You can be in the actual place where some of this history happened and see some of the artifacts. Uh, and then on, I'll say one more that didn't make it on here, but that's okay. On June 30th, we'll be in Salem um, uh, at, at the museum there and presenting on the history of Salem's Chinatown. So go to ohs.org slash exhibits and learn about um, all of these places will be around the state. We're really excited about it. All right, so I'm going to introduce our two speakers tonight. They'll both uh, do their presentations, and then we ask if you have questions for the speakers to put those in the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen or wherever your toolbar is on your Zoom. Uh, and then after they've both presented, uh, I'll pop back on and, and toss those questions to our speakers. So. Our first speaker will be Jennifer Fang, who is Director of Interpretation and Community Engagement at Pittock Mansion and an adjunct professor of history at the University of Portland. She earned her PhD in US history from the University of Delaware with a specialization on race and immigration during the Cold War. As you heard, she was a founding staff member of the Portland Chinatown Museum. And also along with Chelsea Rose, she guest co-edited the winter 2021 special issue of the Oregon Historical Quarterly about Oregon's early Chinese diaspora. She also serves as a member of the OHQ Editorial Advisory Board, and we're glad to have her advice about all things we publish in the journal. Also joining us tonight is another of the authors in our special issue, Myron Louis Lee, who is a descendant of Toysan immigrants who settled in Oregon in the late 1800s. He received his BA from Willamette University and his MD from Oregon Health and Science University. He recently retired from a private family practice in Salem, and he continues to provide care at a local free community clinic where many of the patients are recently arrived immigrants. He's a student of Oregon Chinese history, as well as of Chinese art and culture, and he is a fabulous colleague to work with. We so enjoyed working with him as an author on this issue. So I will now turn it over to Jennifer Fang. Thanks everyone for joining us. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Eliza, for the introduction. Um, thank you all so much for coming to the program tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick and get this PowerPoint started. Um, OK. Um, I'd also uh, like to thank Kapiolani Lee of the Portland Chinatown Museum and you know all the folks at OHS, Eliza Canty jones uh, Aaron Brazel, Sarah Harris, for helping to coordinate um, tonight's panel and for their support in helping to put together this special issue of the Oregon Historical Quarterly. Um, I am absolutely thrilled that Myron has agreed to present about his family's history tonight. And I I, I think we all are, but I'm, I'm very much looking forward to his presentation. Um, so, Oh, I also would like to thank uh, Chelsea Rose real quickly, um, who was uh, the also the guest co-editor of this special issue. Um, Chelsea, it was, I mean, it was just been a joy to work with Chelsea and I le I've learned so much from working with her on this project. So this special issue um, was a two year long project that brought together scholars and researchers from across the state. It highlights some of the really exciting work that's being done across the state 
by state and federal agencies, by archaeologists, historians, and community members to better understand the history of early Chinese Oregonians. And what's really impressive to me about this volume and the contributors here is that many of these people are working in different fields and they are collaborating to plan and produce and interpret this research. Um, much of the scholarship contained in this special issue is previously unknown. And it is also so broad, not only in geographic scope, but also in subject matter. And when taken together as a whole, I believe that it, this special issue that the scholarship contained within it really forces a rethinking of Oregon's past and also offers new ways of thinking about how Oregon was connected to the rest of the West, to the rest of the United States and to the Pacific world. Um, so what becomes apparent in all of these articles uh, in this special issue are a few recurring themes that make it evident to me that um, early diasporic Chinese populations were important players in this early history of Oregon. So first off is that there were Chinese people living and working and building communities and creating businesses and social connections throughout the state. Like this, this action wasn't limited to Portland or to Jacksonville. What you see here are um, places where there was China, evidence of Chinese settlement. Um, this is, you know, happening. This is what Chinese settlement looked like, um, you know, at its peak. This Chinese people have been in Oregon since as early as 1850. That's nearly a decade before Oregon even became a state. Um, they built communities of varying sizes in places that have virtually no Chinese residents today, um, Jacksonville, Malheur National Forest. They also built communities in urban areas like Salem, Ashland, the Dells, and Portland, um, which, you know, continue to have Chinese populations today. Through census records, which, as we know, generally undercount non-white immigrant populations, we see that at different points in time during the first 50 years of this state, Chinese people comprise significant portions of the population. So we see in, the eight, in 1870, Chinese people comprised 42% of Grant County, 12% of Jackson County, 19% of Josephine County. In Clatsop County and Astoria in 1880, they constituted nearly 30% of the population. In 1890 in Portland, they accounted for nearly 10% of the city's total population. Um, the settlement of Chinese people across the state, when we look at this map, this, um, from what I can gather, really tends to mirror that of white settlement in this, in this state. Um, and before the turn of the 20th century, and for many years after, Oregon's Chinese population was the second largest in the United States. Um, you know, I think Oregon oftentimes gets characterized as a very, as a very white state. Um, but part of the reason why this belief persists is because the dominant histories of the state overlook or ignore the many different groups of people of color who were, you know, who were not only here before white settlers, but who arrived, whose arrival overlapped with the arrival of European immigrants or European Americans from other parts of this country. The second, um, I think, overarching theme of this special issue is that Chinese migrants in this early period made a living in a number of different ways in Oregon. So there's this tendency to think that early Chinese immigrants were all unskilled workers and they worked only on the railroad or as miners or in laundries or restaurants. Um, the picture that we get from the special issue is very different from these long held assumptions. Um, I mean, yes, on one hand you do have unskilled workers but you also have highly skilled craftsmen. You have cowboys, you have businessmen, labor contractors and entrepreneurs who are working within highly organized transnational business networks and partnerships. Um, Louis Chung's life, whom Myron will speak about later on, seems to embody many of these complexities. 
And, you know, taking that into account, taking this diversity um, into account, like how does this challenge our understanding of how this population of people carved out a space for themselves in this part of the world? Um, the third overlapping, overarching theme is that Chinese people in Oregon lived transnational lives. What I mean by this is that Chinese Oregonians maintained deep and sustained connections to their home villages and provinces and China in general. Um, and they maintain these connections in many different ways. Um, Early Chinese Oregonians, if not most of them, regardless of their line of work or their class status, operated within these complex transnational business and social systems and networks. Um, one could argue that the eventual passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which would restrict immigration from China and would uphold naturaliz naturalization bans, um, one could argue that the Exclusion Act actually strengthened transnational networks in new and unexpected ways. Um, one example is that, uh, one example that comes to mind is the development of the Paper Sons system, which was a whole system of selling falsified identities and coaching materials to would-be immigrants to help them bypass these immigration laws and gain entry into the United States. Um, these transnational realities offer a line of connection between Oregon to China and the Pacific world. It drives home this fact that the development of Oregon was spurred in part not only by foreign labor, but foreign capital and foreign ideas as well. One of the arguments that um, I make in the introductory essay to this special issue is that Chinese people in Oregon have been twice erased from the popular memory and from the dominant histories of the state. Um, this erasure happens first through restrictive and discriminatory legislation, which dramatically reduced the population of Chinese people in the state and led to political and social and economic marginalization in the places where they lived. The second form of erasure happened through the production and reproduction of historical scholarship. So the doing of history, the writing of history, which until only recently tended to ignore or misinterpret the experiences of Chinese Oregonians and diminished their complexities through an Orientalist or Eurocentric lens. Um, here I have an image of Block 14 at Lone Fir Cemetery, which uh, was a burial site for over a thousand Chinese laborers, as well as asylum patients at the Oregon Hospital for the Insane. Um, I share this image here in part because I was like, what, what image can describe this erasure? Um, but I share this here because I recently had this conversation with someone working on an interpretive project for this site, and she said something to the effect of, the white builders and founders of this city have names and buildings named after them. The Chinese who literally built Portland don't even have gravestones. So, you know, here is, I think, one example of how this erasure happens. Um, the legacies of both forms of erasure here are still deeply ingrained in the lived experiences of Chinese people, and I would say all Asian Americans to this day. And the articles in this special issue offer a reinterpretation or a revision on these misinterpreted histories. And when taken together, the special issue really makes the case that Chinese people played a very prominent and important role in the industrial and economic development of the state. And that they connected Oregon, not only to China, but to the whole of the Chinese diaspora as well. Um, these are histories that, you know, again, force a reconsideration of how Oregon's past has been told. So this is an image of Portland. This is an image of Portland's first street. It was, this picture was taken circa 1857. Um, I think this image offers such a great illustration of this point that I'm trying to make about rethinking um, what we sort of think we already know. 
Um, so pictured here is Portland, two years before Oregon became a state. This is First Avenue, which would have been considered a central part of the city. This photograph is one of actually one of the earliest known photographs of Portland. Uh, to me, and perhaps to you too, this scene looks like kind of like a stereotypical frontier town. It's got muddy streets, you see horse-drawn carriages, you see sidewalks made of wooden planks. And yet right here, front and center, the only clear signage that we can see in this photograph is a sign that reads Hopwo Laundry, a Chinese operated laundry. How does the Hopwo Laundry here in this landscape, how does that combined with the census data that I just shared with you. And all of the scholarship in this special issue challenge our assumptions of what early Oregon looked like. Um, to me, this picture begs the question of, you know, why aren't Chinese people more integrated into our understanding of Oregon's past? And when we do work these early settlers into this dominant historical narrative, how does that change our understanding of this place? And how does that change our understanding of this country? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Chinese diaspora in Oregon and then get into uh, Portland's Chinatowns. So Chinese immigrants um, settling in Portland constituted a majority ethnic group in the city. They were second only to German arrivals in 1860, 1870, and 1910. Other foreign born groups in these earlier decades included British and Irish immigrants, and then Italian, Russian, and Japanese immigrants coming in the 1890s. From the mid 1800s up until 1943, the overwhelming majority of Chinese people who came to the United States Oregon included, were Cantonese Chinese. This is a term that describes a diverse array of regional, linguistic, and ethnic groups in Southern China. Most of these individuals came from rural villages in the Pearl River Delta um, in Guangdong province in Southern China, specifically the Sanyi and Si districts. During the second half of the 19th century, um, there was social and political unrest and unsustainable population density and economic uncertainty in Southern China that propelled this migration of people out. These push factors uh, were not as pronounced in other parts of China, which is why the majority of Chinese immigrants who or Chinese people who left China during this period were coming from this very particular region of China. Um, one of the largest sending districts was Taishan. Immigrants from Taishan represented well over half of all of the Chinese in the United States until 1940. This is where Louis Chang was from. Um, these generations of Chinese Americans spoke Cantonese or Taishanese uh, as opposed to Mandarin, which um, Mandarin has been like the largest dialect group and the national language of China since 1911. Um, the cultural practices that these immigrants brought with them to the United States and reproduced in the United States were generally Southern Chinese in style. This group of Chinese, uh, of Cantonese Chinese represent one of the largest uh, diasporas in human history. These migrants went around the world. The West Coast of the United States just happened to be one of many destinations. And Oregon happened to be one of many destinations where these people landed. Um, migration became such an, a, such an incredibly valuable strategy for Cantonese Chinese families to survive that by the 1890s, many Taishanese people had become highly dependent on their overseas relatives. Family members who immigrated to the United States supported relatives at home by regularly sending remittance payments. Out of this practice of sending money and letters between Southern Chinese villages and other parts of the Chinese diaspora, we see an entire industry of letter writing, money transfer, distribution and delivery emerging. 
Um, this is but one example of the complex transnational networks that diasporic Chinese people created and utilized. Um, this image here, it's uh, not the best image, but these are um, images of uh, a collection of letters from the John Wool Company, which was based in Portland. Um, it's housed at the Portland Chinatown Museum. And um, just putting it out there, as far as I know, it has not yet been translated and could really use some translation. Um, but the money contained in these remittance, remittance payments not only helped support families in China, but they also helped fund public works projects in home villages. Um, this is an image of a Diallo structure in Kaiping. Thousands of these buildings exist primarily in Southern China. Um, so in the early 20th century, these structures were built using money from Chinese people in North America. They were used to protect villages from bandits and warlords. The structures, what we see in these structures are this like flamboyant combination of Chinese and Western architectural styles. Um, but back to Oregon. So Chinese people, although they settled across the state, Portland became a de facto business and community hub for many people. For contract laborers, Portland was often their first stop before heading out to work. And it was often where they returned after jobs finished. White Portlanders, and indeed many white Americans up and down the West Coast, took issue with the presence of Chinese people in, in, in these cities. Um, in, during the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, as anti-Chinese sentiments increased and racial violence escalated throughout the West, um, this violence took place in Seattle, Tacoma, as you can see in this flyer here, um, this is advertising an anti-Chinese um, meeting, um, and Los Angeles, to name a few places. That same, so this type of violence was, took place across in, in many parts of the West, but it didn't occur in Portland to the same degree. Um, this isn't to say that Portland was particularly welcoming or tolerant of Chinese people, but what it does say is that actually what we see is that prominent and powerful Portlanders urged calm and they made the case that Chinese people were needed for the development of the city, the state, and the nation. In the Oregonian, which was owned by Henry Piddick and edited by Harvey Scott at this time, Harvey Scott's editorials supported Chinese exclusion as a means of keeping Chinese immigration in check. But he definitely did not condone violence. He argued repeatedly that the Chinese population in Oregon and Portland needed to be contained and segregated from white people, but that they were that these people were needed in order to build up the city. These editorials cast Chinese people as fundamentally un-American and unassimilable. But they also at the same time made this argument that while this population was still in the United States, their labor needed to be exploited. The Chinese question, this question of what to do with the Chinese in, in, in the West um, went from becoming, went from like a West Coast only issue into a national issue beginning with the 1876 presidential election. With Republicans and Democrats both seeking to win Western votes, anti-Chinese leaders, which were primarily white labor activists, successfully leveraged the power of the regional electorate to demand that lawmakers in DC take action against Chinese immigration. This would pave the way for the passage of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which would be one of the most comprehensive immigration laws of its time. So this law barred the entry of Chinese laborers. There were some groups of Chinese immigrants who were excluded from these restrictions. Um, students, teachers, travelers, merchants, and diplomats were allowed to uh, still enter because the US wanted to maintain good diplomatic and trade relations with China. The act also prohibited all Chinese people from obtaining naturalized citizenship. So the population that was already in America could not become US citizens. 
And if they decided to return to China and you know, return to America as many Chinese immigrants did at this time, they would face trouble re-entering the United States. This law would not be overturned until 1943. And it would not be overturned in any real like significant sense until 1965. So this law becomes the cornerstone of how Americans come to view immigration. Um, and this is how Chinese exclusion kind of expands beyond just a law that impacts Chinese people. It is, it is a law that comes to shape American immigration policy from that point forward. Uh, we very much still live with, I think like the shadows of the, we live in the shadows of this law. Um, this was the turning point after which the US increasingly restricted its borders. It legalized xenophobia on an unprecedented scale it created a category of illegal immigration and defined those who fell into this category as criminals, thereby punishing immigrants who entered the country, quote unquote, illegally and pushing them into the margins of society. It is in this moment that the US stops being a nation that welcomed immigrants with open doors and begins to think of immigration as an issue that needed to be controlled. And the way it needed to be controlled was not by imposing a broad numerical quota, for example, but by thinking about which groups of people did and did not deserve to come to the US and to be part of the US. This law created the apparatus of immigration restriction and exclusion. Um, this law, the, the, the provisions in this law became um, kind of the precursors for green cards, for visas, for border control. It's not a stretch of the imagination to say that the Chinese Exclusion Act transformed how Americans thought about immigration itself, not just Chinese immigration, but all immigration and who did and did not get to become an American. So Portland, Portland has two historic Chinatowns, one in Southwest Portland and one in Northwest Portland. And in looking at these two neighborhoods, we can see how the Chinese Exclusion Act impacted the city's population or the city's Chinese population. So this first Chinatown, uh, the old Chinatown, if you will, was in Southwest. It was fairly large. It stretched from approximately, if you're familiar with the geography of Portland, it stretched from Burnside south to Montgomery, from front west to sixth. It was in existence from roughly the 1860s to the 1910s. Um, today, the neighborhood, this neighborhood is what um, the urban scholar Marie Rose Wong has characterized as a, as a quote unquote extinct urban environment, meaning that the majority of its buildings have long ago and over a period of time been removed or altered. And the first generation of Chinese immigrants have all passed away, leaving behind generations of Chinese Americans who may or may not be able to conjure up the remnants of stories about the lives of those first Chinese settlers. Old Town Chinatown developed during the decades before Chinese exclusion took hold. This was a permanent settlement populated by both permanent settlers and sojourners alike. Um, but it was a home for many people. At its peak in 19, uh, 1900, 1910, it was the second largest Chinatown after San Francisco. Um, here we have an image of Second Avenue circa 1885. This was um, sort of everyday, this was, sorry, the commercial heart of old Chinatown, if you will. Um, so because this neighborhood took shape before exclusionary laws were enacted, it possessed relative economic and generational diversity. There were merchant dry goods stores, laundries, doctor's offices. Some of Portland's first restaurants were in this neighborhood. There were millionaire entrepreneurs, contract laborers, and everybody in between. 
There were men, women, and children. There was also some degree of interaction between Chinese Portlanders, particularly the, the wealthier ones, the more elite ones, and white Portlanders. Um, immigrants belonging to the merchant class often brought with them wives and children, which complicates the stereotype of, China, of Chinatowns being bachelor societies. Between 1900 and 1915, Portland experienced a population and building boom that would directly affect old Chinatown and its residents. Um, Portland city officials and business leaders were committed to the city beautiful movement. And this motivated city leaders and developers and planners to generate plans to redevelop many of the old failing structures in Southwest Portland, particularly in Chinatown or in this old Chinatown. At the same time, city leaders also devised a plan to relocate Portland's Chinese population into a more contained area. Um, in 1907, the Oregonian reported that the Chinese would soon be relocated to a quote unquote, large and commodious building on a site in the north end of the city with a capacity to accommodate the population of the district. In the eyes of city leaders, the land south of Burnside was becoming far too valuable to be a Chinatown. And so this neighborhood needed to be removed of its population and rebuilt to make it more desirable to whites. This population boom in Portland also coincided with the passage and repeated renewals of the Chinese Exclusion Act. So many Chinese Portlanders faced two formidable challenges. Not only did they have to navigate increasing restrictions and discrimination, they were also being priced, or they were being priced and pushed out of their places of residence and businesses. Um, between 1900 and 1930, Portland's general population grew tremendously from 90,000 people to 300,000 people. At the same time, the Chinese population, what once used to make up close to 10% of Portland's over, overall population dropped from 8,000 people to 1,500 people. During this time, many old Chinatown business owners sold their operations or buildings and moved away. Some left Portland altogether but many also moved across Burnside and settled in a multi in a multi ethnic neighborhood that was home to Japanese immigrants, Scandinavians, Greek, Romani and blacks. This neighborhood would come to be known as New Chinatown. Many people today know of New Chinatown by the Chinatown Gateway that is situated at Northwest Fourth and Burnside. This gateway was installed in 1986. This new Chinatown stretches from roughly Burnside north to Gleason, from Third Avenue to Broadway. Chinatown um, in this new neighborhood, community and family organizations, tongs and merchants signed long-term land leases and built large mixed use buildings, similar to the ones in old Chinatown. But in some ways, this new Chinatown um, was, much more of an ethnic enclave than old Chinatown ever was. New Chinatown would eventually develop much firmer and much, much more fixed borders. And in some ways, this new Chinatown exhibited some traits of ghettos as well because of the economic and demographic strains that exclusionary laws had placed on the Chinese population. Um, Within New Chinatown, there were far fewer economic opportunities um, in this neighborhood that existed in old Chinatown decades earlier. And in most cases, the Chinese Portlanders of New Chinatown um, were unable to work or socialize outside of this neighborhood. But life continued. People eked out a living, they built community, they made a life for themselves in Portland and across the state. Children attended Chinese school on weeknights and Saturdays at the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, which still stands in New, in, in New Chinatown. Um, the Cantonese Opera Ensemble, the Yatsing Music Club, formed in the 1930s and continues to exist to this day. Nowadays, 
Chinese owned restaurants and community and cultural organizations still exist within New Chinatown, but the neighborhood is a sliver of what it once was. And following the passage of the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, Portland's Chinese population, much like the rest of the country, grew and became much more diverse with Chinese immigrants coming from other parts of China and the Chinese diaspora. Generally speaking, um, Portland's, uh, the Chinese population in Portland and in the United States now, um, this contemporary population, doesn't really look that much like the population of this early generation. Um, we have Chinese people coming from all different parts of, of the country, also coming from you know, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, Vietnam. Um, and also generally speaking, this contemporary population is somewhat divided um, between foreign born and American born. It's divided between classes. It's highly divided between political beliefs as well. Um, Chinese American cultural life in this region continues to thrive, but it has shifted toward the east side and the suburbs. Um, so that's kind of all I have for you all today. Up next, we have Myron Lee, who will be sharing his research about Louis Chung. And you know, when I first read Myron's manuscript, I just want to say I was I was really blown away by how Louis Chung lived through this early diasporic exclusionary period and how the trajectory of his extraordinary life encompassed so many of the complexities of Chinese American history in Oregon. Um, and so with that, I will pass it over to Myron. Myron, are you ready? Thanks so much, Jennifer. Okay. That was a brilliant presentation. It's been such a pleasure working with you. So I'm especially grateful to the Oregon Historical Society and the Portland Chinatown Museum who've made this evening possible. And particularly to Eliza, Chelsea, Rose, and Jennifer, thank you for your work in editing this remarkable issue of the Oregon Historical Quarterly. Uh, many of the historical photographs of Portland's uh, Chinatown in this program are from the Oregon Historical Society collection. And many of the family photographs are from uh, my cousins, Lee Louie and Bobby Sue, and I'm very grateful for your sharing these. Uh, my brothers and I grew up in Lad's Edition in Southeast Portland. Mom and dad were both great storytellers. Dad told us scary stories about his village in Toysan, and mom told stories about growing up in Chinatown. This wasn't the Chinatown we knew as kids, though. It was an even older ch uh, Chinatown that had disappeared by then. Sometimes after taking me down to the dentist, we'd walk downtown and mom would point out where she used to live on Southwest 2nd Street between Stark and Oak, where their store used to be near the old police station. One time we went to the, her old Chinese school at Zhonghua, the CCBA, and she pointed out this old photo at the foot of the stairs. She told me, that's your grandfather. He's bringing in some vegetables from the farm to feed the hungry people. And so I wondered, who was my grandfather and what was this Chinatown? Lui Chung came from a little village in Guangdong province in Southeast China. And as Jennifer said, uh, most of the early Chinese immigrants to Oregon came from the same area. There was a uh, four county area. We called it Se Yup. Uh, it's also known as Si Yi. And in this part of uh, Southern Guangdong province, they all shared the same traditions, the same uh, history, and the same. they spoke the same, uh, we call it the Sayup Cantonese dialect. This is a blown up map of uh, Guangdong province and the four county area is down here. Uh, back in my grandfather's day, Toisan was actually called Sunning province and um, in this small area near the coast is a place called Hoiyin, and that was where my uh, grandfather's family was from. 
he came from a farming fam family and they grew rice with the other villagers and they herded geese and ducks. They shared community fish ponds. Each family had their own plot of vegetables and their own chickens. His family earned extra money by paddling a boat on the local river from village to village selling cloth goods. When Lu Chung was about eight years old, he lost both of his parents and later both of his brothers. His extended family in the village raised him up until his teen years. And then he signed up with a labor contractor to come to America to work on the railroads in Oregon. When Louis Chung came to Oregon in 1892, he had a shaved forehead and queue like all the other Chinese laborers then. It took him about six weeks on a sailing vessel to cross the Pacific. He arrived 10 years after the 1882 Exclusion Act was passed. So as Jennifer said, the 1882 Act specifically prohibited Chinese laborers like Louis Chung from entering the country. But enforcement of the act was loose and Oregon's economy was booming. So labor contractors found lots of ways to get around the law and bring workers in. Railroad workers um, at that time um, had a great deal of uh, uh, difficulty during uh, different seasons. They earned about a dollar a day and uh, through, uh, with that, you'd have to pay your own room and board. If you were a Chinese railroad worker, you'd live in camps along the rail lines and the work was really uh, hard physical labor that was often dangerous. Most of the Chinese laborers survived and they were able to save money to send home. But in 1893, uh, the building boom uh, collapsed and an economic depression set in. Many of the railroad uh, workers had to find other work in towns and Lui Chung along with a lot of the other workers uh, came to Portland then to look for work. When he came to Portland, he found a large Chinese community that stretched along Southwest 2nd Avenue for over 20 blocks. There were 4,500 Chinese in Portland then, which is about one in every 10 Portlanders. There were over 120 Chinese businesses occupying 40 different uh, city blocks. They had large uh, outdoor Chinese markets, a Chinese temple, five Chinese missions with schools, even a Chinese theater. Gambling houses were there and opium smoking parlors were there. Louis Chung found work wherever he could. In 1894, there was a great flood that inundated downtown Portland and much of Chinatown. Uh, people had to get around on boats or on these rickety raised walkways. Louis Chung, even at the age of 18, was resourceful and saw a business opportunity. He made and sold door-to-door -door Zhong Che's. Now, Zhong Che's were a perfect meal in one for the time, portable and water resistant. They were large steamed sticky rice dumplings filled with mung beans, peanuts, black mushrooms, and a piece of salted pork all wrapped up with fragrant bamboo leaves. Lu Chung as a teenager worked as a farmhand and he was very familiar with this coming from a farm, farming family in uh, Hoi Yin. And uh, he probably worked on one of these uh, uh, Chinese farms in Portland's Tanner Creek Gulch or in Guilds Lake uh, area. The vegetables that they uh, grew at that time were carried from door to door in large baskets by street peddlers or sold in the open market downtown on Alder Street. This was a description of that marketplace at the time. Alder Street between 2nd and 3rd is used daily and for many hours of the day as mar a marketplace where horse teams stand for the disposal of vegetables and firewood. The sidewalk occupied by the Chinese is on the curb as well as on the inside used for the storage and sale of coops of chickens, duck, ducks, etc. Vegetables are arranged and displayed on the sidewalks. There are meat stalls where butcher's meat and offal is for sale in the open window space. There are vegetables, fish, and fowl on the sidewalk. So you can kind of get an idea of what it looked like at the time. For a time, Louis Chung worked as a live-in domestic servant for a Portland family. 
At the time, young immigrants who are usually white females or Chinese males did the bulk of domestic chores for many white families. They did the cleaning, the laundry, cooking, and even childcare. Some employers were kinder than others. Louis Chung told stories about poor treatment by one employer and being locked up in the basement every night. He eventually found other work, including bartending at a couple of the popular saloons near Chinatown. So in these jobs as a servant and a bartender, he was exposed to English every day and needed to learn language skills to survive. This is uh, the same photo that Jennifer had. It's uh, from Chinatown looking up Southwest 2nd Avenue towards the First Presbyterian Church. Now the First Presbyterian Church and four others established Chinese missions in downtown Portland and had schools every evening where Chinese workers could come and learn English. Uh, just as important as the language lessons was learning about the cultural norms for Portland's white society. Lu Chung took advantage of the Chinese mission school and became fluent in speaking, reading, and writing. This was really crucial for him to be successful in Portland at the time. He, in addition, he adopted the Christian faith at the time, and his family always talked about uh, him loving uh, singing the hymns from his Sunday services. Wu Chung kept uh, his Hoi Yin connection strong, both with his home village in China and with the Portland Chinatown community. He became an apprentice to Ju Su, a powerful businessman in Chinatown, who also came from Hoi Yin district. Ju Su managed On Wotong, a Chinese medicinal herb and tea company. He also owned several gambling operations in Chinatown. He became somewhat of a mentor uh, to Lui Chung and taught him what he needed to do to survive as a merchant in Chinatown. So On Wotong was a traditional Chinese medicine center owned by a number of shareholders and run by a manager. It was a successful business, but it was also a gathering place for the community. People would come to learn the news, talk with each other, get help with sending a letter to the home village or book a ticket on a steamship home. They oftentimes need help with legal issues. And because of his fluency in uh, English, Lu Chung served as a translator and had many connections with Portland's white legal and political establishment. He became uh, known as the person to go to if you needed help. So in this family uh, photo, uh, this is Ju Su, his, um, uh, his business partner, and Lui Chung is to the right of the table there. Uh, the herbalist Ji Ching Chow is behind the counter there. And um, these characters on Wotong uh, means uh, peaceful, harmonious hall. And um, Behind On Wartong's uh, still reinforced door here, um, there was a very lucrative gambling business that Ju Su had started and that Louis Chung kept flourishing. They had a daily lottery, mahjong, Chinese dominoes, or pai go. Uh, on Wartong was only one of 40 gambling and lottery businesses in Chinatown at the time. It wasn't just in Chinatown, there's gambling that was really widely practiced in the white run saloons in town too. The gambling of course was illegal and there were regular raids and arrests made on uh, both the customers and the proprietors. The Chinese gaming houses were specifically targeted by Portland law enforcement. If you were a customer and you were caught, you were fined $7.50. And if you were the proprietor, you got fined $25. I found evidence in the newspapers of the time that Louis Chung paid these fines on a regular basis. My mom would tell about uh, On Wartong's elaborate defenses against the raids. Boys served as lookouts outside and they would give an early warning signal if the police were coming. There were peepholes where the gambling proprietors could look out into the store to see who was coming. In the ceiling of the gambling room, there was a trap door that led to the living apartments above where the cash box from the gambling room could be quickly pulled up when the raid started. Now, amazingly, uh, despite these raids, uh, Louis Chung got along well with the Portland Police Department, it was just a block away from his store. He had a personal relationship with several of the inspectors there, 
contributed regularly to their charities and with his English skills often served as an interpreter in court for them. Being a part owner of the On Wotong business meant that Lui Chung had achieved the status of a merchant. Now, if you were a merchant, you could do things that a laborer couldn't do. You were allowed to carry a certificate of residence. You could travel between the US and China and uh, back and forth for business trips. And importantly, you also had the right to potentially bring over a wife and children. So in 1897, Louis Chung returned to the, his Hoi Yin village and through a matchmaker met and married Ju Sim Yuk. Uh, he was 21 and she was 18, the third daughter of a Hoi Yin family that owned the local pawn shop. Uh, Ju Sim Yuk, or Po Po, as we called her grandmother, um, was like others in her social class. She had unbound feet and no formal education. But uh, we all remember her strong, independent spirit and a great sense of humor. And in her youth, she was have, uh, said to have had a perfect complexion. Uh, Louis Chung stayed on in his Sek Lohang village for nearly two years, long enough for the birth of his first son, who died in infancy. Ju Sim became pregnant again, but Louis Chung had to return to Oregon before his daughter, Louis Yo Dai or Bessie, was born. It took 11 long years before he was finally able to bring them both over to join him. Now, in those 11 years, Louis Chung became a major owner and manager of his uh, uh, medicinal and herb store uh, on Wartong, but he also became the principal owner and manager of a second business next door, Gui Heng, a jewelry and clock store. And this is a photo of that. Uh, Louis Chung is here, his senior partner who founded the business uh, even 20 years earlier than that is here. And uh, he has two shareholders there on the other side of the counter. Now, Gui Heng specialized in jade and 24 karat Chinese gold, the soft kind, but um, his clientele wasn't just Chinese. He had a, uh, half of his clientele was white and the success of his two businesses depended a great deal on his uh, ease of communicating with both segments of society. Over time, Louis Chung obtained the documentation uh, necessary to become a citizen of the United States. At that time, there was no real legal pathway for Chinese from China to become naturalized citizens, unlike white immigrants who could become naturalized in two years. So Lu Chung took a practical approach to what he considered unjust laws at the time. He claimed a birthplace in Portland's Chinatown and basically moved on with his life. With citizenship status, Louis Chung could finally own and not just lease property. He never strayed far from his agricultural roots. As a youth, he had worked as a farmhand. He later leased property in the Willamette Valley and grew hops. But with citizenship, he was able to buy a 219-acre farm just off North Columbia Boulevard. He caught at Louis Chung Gardens and grew all kinds of produce there and provided employment for a number of Chinese farm workers. He also bought a number of other residential and commercial properties, hoping to provide security for the future. Lu Chung was active in many community organizations. He was an officer of the powerful Bing Gong Tong, and all, but he was also an officer of the Chinese Peace Society. This latter group helped to negotiate peace agreements between the Tongs during Portland's long Tong Wars that lasted over several decades. Lu Chung lost his immediate family members in China at a young age, but he was able to build his own family in Portland. He brought over his wife and daughter, Bessie, in 1911. They initially lived just south of the main Chinatown on Southwest Columbia. Over time, the family moved and renovated to the apartments above their store on Second Avenue. In 1913, Edward was born, and in 1916, Louis Chung delivered my mom, Hazel, at home during a uh, snowstorm. Billy came in 1917 and Rose in 1920. They were the first native-born legal citizens in the Louis family. Hazel, my mom, and her older brother, Edward, are here in 1916, dressed up for the Portland Rose Festival. 
They had an annual Chinese baby show there with prominent Portland officials acting as judges. The festival gave prizes for different attributes, including the fattest baby under the age of six. Mom tells us it was a banner year for the family because she brought home the prize for being the youngest at four months and her brother Edward got the best boy overall under the age of six. Chinese New Year's was a special time for my mom. She remembered it well. She would get up early in the morning and wear, put on her Chinese outfit, attach all her separate gold buttons and run downstairs from their apartment to Anwa Tong below. She'd be carrying a tray of fun bok che, which is made from a huge tub of sticky rice filled with freshly ground peanuts, sweetened winter melon and fresh coconuts all shaped into delicious balls. She'd help her mom make them up the night before, and then she'd take the tray up around to each of the men gathered downstairs and greet them. They, they would return the greeting and take a, a ball of the fun bok che and slip her a red fung bao envelope with some money slipped inside. The rest of the day, and in fact, the rest of the week would be filled with feasting and firecrackers and paying respect to the ancestors. My mom's on the left there at the age of eight, and her Little brother Billy is above her and Louis Chung is to the right there. Louis Chung in his later years was best known for his philanthropy which extended well beyond Chinatown. He'd always been a resource for the lonely or sick members of the Chinese community. But an economic depression hit Portland in the mid 1920s and winter came and so did cold and hunger for many Portlanders. Wu Chung would bring in truckloads of produce from his farm and give it away to the needy families, most of them Portland's white community. He was quoted by the local newspaper shortly after one of these deliveries in late December. There are many, many people in the city who know hunger and this small offering may help keep hunger away on Christmas day. I would be a poor man and a mean man indeed if I did not think at this time of year of those who may not have enough food to drive away the hunger. Wu Chung died in 1926 when mom was 10 and shortly before his 50th birthday. Although nothing survives of his businesses or his properties, he did leave a legacy of kindness, hard work and love of family that his descendants have tried to carry on. So searching for Louis Chung's story started with my mom's stories and family traditions. Going up to River, Riverview Cemetery every year to clean off the gravestones and buy or honor our ancestors, mom would read the Chinese writing on her dad's gravestone out loud. So if a Chinese gravestone is complete, it has their full married name, their uh, date of birth, date of death, and uh, their birthplace, uh, really right down to the very specific village hamlet. So in the middle here, we see uh, his formal married name, Louis Hawk Mien. And on the right side, we see uh, his, we see Toy San and uh, Hoi Yin, and that's his uh, county and his uh, district area. And over on the left, we see Sek Lo Hang Chun, and that's his small little village. So. If a Chinese person is looking for their ancestral village and where they came from, the gravestone is really the best place to start. In mid-December of 2006, my family and I flew to Guangzhou. We had the information from Louis Chung's gravestone, a few years of community college Mandarin, and some recent refresher lessons, uh, speaking twice on with my mom. My son Jordan was studying Chinese in Shanghai at the time and was pretty fluent in Mandarin. At the hotel where we stayed, the desk helped us find a driver who spoke Toisan in Mandarin, but no English. He drove us for three and a half hours from Guangzhou to Hoi Yin. It was Christmas time, but it was very warm, green, and beautiful. We were near the coast and saw flocks of geese and ducks, community fish ponds, and green rice fields. There were water buffalo being led by young boys on the road. To find Lu Chung's small village, our driver would stop frequently and ask until we finally found Little Sek Lo Hang or Pomegranate Village. It was much like the stories we were told, a small rural hamlet with vegetable gardens, wandering chickens, and surrounding rice fields. 
and friendly people, most of whom shared the same last surname of Louis. They all spoke the same familiar village dialect with, of my mom, my Auntie Bessie, and Paul Paul, my grandmother. We were introduced to Louis Wei Fun, a village elder in his 90s. He invited us to drink tea in his home. Although none of Louis Chung's family had visited for over a hundred years, he began to recite the history of Louis Chung and our family. He said to us, let me tell you about Louis Chung, your grandfather, and you tell me if this is right. And then he proceeded to tell us many historical facts about our family's history, both in China and in the US. He told of Louis Yo Gum or Henry, an adopted son of Edward, the firstborn in the US who became the first physician in the Louis family and of Billy, the youngest son who visited his mother's home in Hoi Yin while studying in China during his university days, but wasn't able to visit his father's home village of Sep Lo Hong. And he finally led us to the home where Lui Chung was born and where one of his brothers was buried. At the time, it was housing two large healthy pigs. It was the first home of Lui Chung and Po Po after they got married. And just outside Louis Chung's home was a familiar scene. There were narrow mud pathways between wide raised beds planted thickly with bok choy, Chinese cucumbers, winter melon, and beans staked with bamboo poles. It looked a lot like my mom and dad's backyard garden when I was growing up in Lad's Edition. And it looked like a lot like my own backyard garden in Salem as well. I imagine Louis Chung as a boy tending the vegetables here, and then as a young man walking with Po Po, his new bride in the pathways that first year after they got married. Surrounded by the greenery and the earthy smells, the friendly faces and voices, there is a sense of peace and home. I realized that our journey to learn the story of my grandfather had ended here in the village where his had first begun. Thank you all for listening this evening. Thank you so much, Myron and Jennifer. These are <clears throat> wonderful presentations and we really appreciate all the work that you both put into them. As someone noted on uh, the chat, those are just incredible photographs, Myron. Your family has kept stories and images and we're just all so grateful for them being kept and for you sharing those with us. We have a couple of questions and I'll just encourage folks to use the, the Q&A to add more questions. We have a few minutes for this time and. One of the questions uh, is asking for tips for researching Chinese American ancestors in Portland and or Oregon. So you spoke a little bit about um, using the uh, gravestones. And I'll say there is one article in the special issue that has to do with um, some research that can be done uh, via an online database as well. So um, if you don't already have a copy, that might be of interest to you as well. But please, the tips on research. Myron, do you have yeah, those? I can, I can mention that again. I think one of the best resources, if you are lucky enough, is to have a very complete uh, gravestone with the Chinese characters, because that's really the key. Um, in the villages, the small villages, they still got go by the old names, although on a uh, Google map, you'll only find the uh, newer names, many of which have changed. But if you get the general area, you're going to be pretty close. The very last article uh, in this, uh, uh, issue uh, is by Henry Tom, and he goes over that in detail. There's a, a database called Village DB uh, online that is just a tremendous resource. You can uh, go by your surname or by the village name and pretty much narrow it down to uh, oftentimes the in single individual village. And, and we've helped a number of families actually with their search for their uh, uh, ancestral village that way. And it's a there are really uh, tremendous resources to use. So the gravestone, the village uh, database, and this article by Henry Tom is uh, particularly good. He also gives uh, workshops uh, on a regular basis around the uh, country, actually, that you can attend uh, so that he can give you one-on-one -on -one mentorship for that. Thank you very much. That's helpful. And I'll I'll also say that um, you know the OHS Research Library is is open and accessible to all. So if you're looking for uh, some additional resources on on Portland history or Oregon history, to please come 
check us out as well. There may be some context or some photographs or business records or kinds of things there. Uh, someone is, has done a close reading of your article, Myron, and is interested if you have any additional uh, leads or sources on the five English language schools for Chinese immigrants that were created by local Christian churches. Uh, and there's a, a footnote 24 they're noting, uh, a letter by Reverend W.S. Holt that you used for that information. Do you have any additional information or leads on that aspect of the history? Yes. Uh so actually, I contacted the First Presbyterian Church, and they did have some amazing records, uh, although they didn't have the specific uh, census of the Chinese uh, individuals who attended those mission schools at the time. But they have some amazing um, uh, photographs, data, uh, and um, articles written by William Holt. We do think that uh, it is most likely that uh, it was the Holt Presbyterian uh, mission that uh, Louis Chung was a part of, because we know that uh, that uh, his son actually attended that church later, but we could not find any hard evidence of his name on their role, so it was uh, difficult for me to say precisely. Um, but uh, the Holt uh, Church particularly kept very uh, good records of uh, of how their mission came to being, and um, really the, uh, the the actual teachers that taught there. And it's a, it's a really a fascinating. Uh, uh, article, uh, potential article uh, uh, of research that uh, uh, one could go into. And, um, and I do have the names of uh, the other uh, five uh, uh, churches actually that were involved with that too. So uh, yeah, I'd be glad if you leave your email in the chat to uh, be, be able to send you some more information on that. Oh, that's great. I just want to chime in here and say that um, kind of echo what Myron's saying about just church records in general. Um, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of churches at this in this early period um, considered their work in Chinatowns as foreign mission work, um, and they kept very good. I mean, the the records are pretty solid, um, and I also would say that. Uh, you know, depending on, you know, how you want to approach whatever research, a lot of churches and American universities also had satellite operations or satellite campuses in China. And there are also really good records that like following that path as well. Thank you very much. There's a, <clears throat> a question, <coughs> excuse me. About uh, Jennifer, you, you talked some about the erasure of this history. And so there's a question about if there are plans to put up placards at places where there were significant Chinese historical questions and uh, an attempt to, to correct that, that second part of the erasure that you talked about. So, you know, Jennifer, I'll turn that over to you and Myron also if you have comments on that and then I can, you know, come back if there's anything I have to add. Yeah, um, I think, you know, there is a lot of work being done on Block 14 right now um, in Lone Fir. So that's one area, like one very specific area where there is this attempt to um, to undo this erasure. And this project is really being, um, it's being approached by many different entities as a like, as a project specifically to undo this like process of erasure. Um, and, you know, everything, I think like all the, all the traumas that, you know, the, the like generational traumas that come up with that. Um, and I mean, I know that there, I don't think that there is any organized, like large effort beyond what the Oregon Chinese diaspora project is working on across the state to, you know, put up, um, markers or like to do this interpretive work of these different sites but there I feel like there there is this type of work happening but it's not it's not super connected if you will like Myron is involved in some projects in Salem is my understanding um with the Salem cemeteries and the Qingming festival um Eliza you can probably also speak to some some other projects that are happening as well Myron, yeah. do you want to speak to what's happening in Salem on that? Uh, yes, I, I can. Um, again, Salem, uh, Salem's Chinatown is like Portland's uh, first Chinatown. It 
there it has basically become extinct no real uh firm remnants other than in the cemetery area and uh yeah there are attempts to um um bring some of this history back and uh i'm just happy that there's interest in the community both the, from the city and the willamette heritage center to uh try and bring some of this history to light i i wanted to maybe comment on the fact that uh, uh the historical archaeology uh, that is going on is really um uh chelsea rose's uh, work and her colleagues is really going to make, I think, a big difference in terms of how this history is brought forth and interpreted, uh, particularly the transnational efforts uh, that are um, uh, doing work uh, in these communities where the uh, individuals uh, came from. And uh, we're hoping that um, written records actually can be uh, uh, restored in some cases from individuals who um, who were basically telling their own history and their own words and their own language. So we're hoping that some of that can be found. I just wanna add one really exciting uh, detail to this and that is that there are virtual reality projects underway as well, connected to Lone Fir um, and other monuments throughout town that will help envision this. Uh, certainly we need physical um, monuments as well. So I, I mean, I think in some ways the Portland Chinatown Museum um, is is itself, um, you know, it's it's more than a placard, of course, but I think being there um, in you know that that historical Chinatown that's in Portland is is a good place to go. I'll say a couple of other things. I think that um, there's opportunity through the Travel Information Council, which is a, a semi-independent state agency that runs the historical marker program around the state and often places historical markers at locations, um, often working with ODOT or local communities. And so um, that, that entity, which I've been in, involved with, we accept um, nominations for markers around the state. So I think there's real opportunity because of um, the work that archeologists and the Chinese Biospora Project have done to really make this documentation so clear. Um, so, so look us up. Um, and this is a good reminder to me to bring some of these uh, recommendations as well, because there is uh, so much opportunity there. The other thing I'll say, even though this is not exactly the question, but I think <clears throat> oftentimes uh, there are questions about, well, is this being taught in schools? Um, and I can say that the state of Oregon uh, adopted uh, just over a year ago, uh, new social sciences standards integrated with ethnic studies. And it really does call on teachers across the state to be uh, teaching history of, of Oregon that recognizes and includes um, contributions of groups of people who have been erased, um, so like the Chinese diaspora. So um, that will be required by fall of 2026. And so we're really hopeful and OHS is looking for ways to support teachers in bringing this information into classrooms as well. So um, indeed really working on making that more visible. So thanks very much um, to, the, to the audience member for this question. And please um, feel free to reach out to the Travel Council or OHS or others of us if you have some additional recommendations um, for ways that, that folks can get involved. There's another uh, comment in the Q&A that's really appreciating the transnational connections uh, that were a part of this, um, a part of this history and so much a part of the histories that you told and that are in the special issue. And they're talking about contemporary research on Mexican migrants in the United States that emphasizes that ongoing transnational aspects of migrant lives, businesses, cultural connections. So I'm gonna uh, drop, use this opportunity to drop a little link in there about a, an OHQ piece on some of, of those more recent transnational connections. But I wonder if either of you would wanna speak to more on that in, in your own work, you know, I think Myra in that, that story that you told about going back to your grandfather's village is really just so powerful. But whether you're, you know, in your research on this history, but then also thinking about the significance of these transnational connections uh, in, in communities here in the United States today, how are you thinking about these connections? Yeah, well, um, yeah, so that uh, trip that I described was the first of, um, of uh, three trips actually that I've made back uh, to the village area and um, each time you learn something uh, and uh, you make a connection uh, in some 
some cases it was with the Louis side of the family, and in some cases it's with the Lee uh, side of the family. Um, the um, and the it's diff it's more difficult certainly over the last uh, uh, couple of years to try and uh, uh, do this type of uh, travel, but uh, I think the um, some of the uh, connections already that. Uh, are uh, being made in the research that Stanford's doing, for example, uh, uh, is really uh, going to help that out for a, a lot of families. And I know that uh, a comment was made by uh, Gordon Chang, I think, that none of the uh, railroad workers in the uh, transcontinental uh, uh, railroad, uh, none of, they had no written record uh, written in their own words about their experiences. And uh, yeah, that, that type of thing, I think, is um, um, uh, we hope that uh, the his that type of history can be uh, uncovered with with those types of efforts. Yeah, Jennifer, you Thanks. probably yeah. Go ahead, Myron. Oh, you probably have uh, more to say about the transnational efforts, also. Yeah, I mean, I think that speaking like thinking of it from sort of like a scholarship perspective I and from like an immigration history perspective to me it just seems like until relatively recently like within the past like couple of decades or so um immigration history was not like I think immigration history was really just the way that it was done, the way that it was told was it was looking specifically at the experiences of immigrants in the United States. It's like people came from, they came to the United States from whatever country they were from and they stayed here and they never looked back. Um, but that's, you know, just even like when you think it's like when you take a common sense approach to it, that's like, that's not how people live. Um, people maintain connections to the places they leave behind. Um, and those connections go beyond just family connections. They, you know, they're, they're cultural, they're intellectual, they're economic. Um, and so it's been so wonderful to see, um, I don't know if you, this like this transnational turn, if you will, in like, um, in, in immigration history, like to think about it, immigration as um as a process and as a as like this back and forth not as like a linear one directional thing um and so you know this is definitely the case with chinese immigrants but i think this is the case with all immigrant groups yeah i mean that's making me think of um joanna ogden's work on uh yeah your <laughs> the, the uh South Asian immigrants from, from India, from the Punjab region, and many who came and were working in the early 20th century along the Columbia River and then went back to India, many of them to overthrow uh, the British colonizers. So it's really, you know, those connections were obviously kept. Um, Myron, I'm thinking about, there's a question here uh, of whether your family was the only Chinese family in Lad's edition. What was the neighborhood like where you grew up as far as the, the ethnic makeup of it? Now, Lad's edition was actually a um, a mixture. We had uh, uh, Chinese neighbors, Jewish neighbors, Italian neighbors. So, in the fifties uh, and early sixties, uh, it was uh, really it was a pretty amazing mixture of a lot of uh, immigrant culture that was there. Partly uh, by uh, because that was the only choice. Uh, there were uh, uh, laws that prohibited uh, Chinese and other Asian uh, groups and um, ethnic minority groups from living in many parts of Portland. Uh, when my uh, dad and mom were looking for a house in the 30s, uh, they, uh, Lad's Edition is one of the few places actually that uh, would accept them. So, um, so in a way, uh, it proved to be a melting pot uh, uh, to some extent. And in my grade school at Abernethy, uh, there were both uh, Asians, African Americans, Jewish, Italians, and so um, it was a it was a um, colorful neighborhood actually to grow up in. Yeah. Um, I I wanted to oh sorry I I wanted to I forgot to mention this in in my presentation I'm so glad Myron talked about this, um, which is in this like transition between in this 
period of movement between old Chinatown and new Chinatown, um, a lot of Portland's Chinese population, like Portland's Chinese population shrunk. Um, a lot of people went back to China. A lot of people went to other parts of the country. A lot of people, some people moved to new Chinatown, but some people also moved to Lad's Edition. Um, so Lad's Edition is, uh, the, the Chinese settlement there is, begins pretty early. Um, I saw something in the chat about the Baptist, the Chinese Baptist church um, in Lad's Edition. And that's, I feel like that's, Myron, you probably have more experience with this, but like that to me is just, that church is, seems like it's been there for a very long time. Um, that to me is like sort of this like indicator that you have this um, kind of a longstanding Chinese um, community there. Right, uh, yeah, the Chinese Baptist Church and the Chinese Presbyterian Church uh, both uh, you know, both had uh, active memberships during the entire time uh, we were growing up. And uh, you know, probably some of our uh, you know, listeners uh, know more of the specific uh, history in terms of when those original um, uh, churches were founded. But uh, yeah, they were, uh, um, they were neighborhood uh, churches and uh, uh, particularly the Chinese Presbyterian Church uh, um, they had services both in English and Chinese uh, there and uh, in Chinese, uh, Cantonese actually. So, um, yeah, and they had uh, a really pretty good um, mixture in their congregation of both Chinese and, and, uh, and white uh, uh, Portlanders. Well, in case uh, there's any question, I'll just say that, that the Oregon Historical Quarterly would absolutely welcome a manuscript submission on this history of Lad's edition. That really is fascinating that there was not the kind of segregation practice there as in other parts of Portland in the early 20th century. And then here's uh, someone in the chat who's, who's letting us know that the original Chinese Baptist Church was on Northwest 6th and Cooch. And then their new building was established in Lad's edition in the 1950s. So thank wow. you. Uh, very much, Sarah. We appreciate that. Um, you know, also in the chat, thinking about the ways, uh, thanks to Joe, thinking about the ways that these transnational histories help us think about the United States differently and maybe undercut some of that exceptionalism uh, myth that we can find in some of our history. I know we're running up on time. There's one question about family building in the Q&A that I do want to want to ask and to see where their um, where their families formed with Chinese immigrants. Um, and local uh, indigenous people here in Oregon, uh, members of, of tribes here. Do you see any evidence of that or other ways that folks were building uh, families outside the Chinese immigrant community? Hmm. Yeah. It's okay if not. I, if you haven't seen the evidence, that's okay yeah, to say. I, well, when my mom was growing up, uh, uh, there were uh, although there were laws against, uh, you know, intermarriage at the time, uh, she said that uh, they oftentimes were ignored and not enforced. So there, um, there were there was intermarriage between the uh, uh, Chinese and African Americans. Uh, in, and uh, let's see, um, yeah, I, I can think of at least several uh, couples that my uh, mom would talk about. Now that was really back in the 1920s and 30s. So that was a uh, yeah, and they basically ignored some of the existing laws against uh, interracial marriage at the time. Yeah. I, you know, so I, it's, it's funny, like, I, I, this question has come up before in other presentations, and I'm like, I don't know the answer to that, but I should really look this up, and then I never do. Um, <laughs> but I, I, so I, I don't know. I need. I think that it it deserves some research. Um, I'm, you know, I know that there was intermarriage between like black pioneers and native people, um, but I don't know if that's the case with Chinese people. Um, and I, I mean, I just, I, I'm not sure. I would imagine, you know, just given if there is like close proximity of settlement um, that that must have happened. Um, but I don't, I have not seen any record of it. That's interesting. 
I would like the, the anecdotal answers of, from you, Myron, and then also from someone in the chat saying, hey, one of my good friends is Chinese Mexican. So people are gonna do what people are gonna do. And so I think that's, that's for sure. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. I, I want to just say again how much we appreciate um, all that you brought to us this evening. Thanks to Portland Chinatown Museum for being our partner and putting on this program. We're really grateful to you. Uh, we appreciate the support of Wells Fargo, uh, which supported the creation of this special issue and is also um, supporting us with some additional funding uh, for the OHQ on the road tour. So we hope you'll join us. And we also um, are going to be able to have a couple more of the articles from the special issue translated into Chinese, and those will be up on our website. So Myron, we're planning to do uh, your article as one of those. You can read Jennifer's introduction in English or Chinese on the OHS website abstracts for all the articles in both languages um, and just you know all the folks who are out here with this great information and asking these great questions we just want to make it very clear that we don't think this is the end of our publication on Chinese history in Oregon uh, we are hungry for more manuscript submissions on this history and more opportunities to host talks about this history so please be in touch and thanks very much everyone for spending the evening with us it's just been fantastic we appreciate it have a terrific evening, folks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.